Hey everybody, welcome to another Family Night at Faith Bible Church once again. It's a little bit different this week as we are pre-recording everything and uh, still able to participate being live together through the miracle of social media. So we hope you'll let us know where you are as you are commenting on YouTube or Facebook. Here in just a moment, we're going to be singing together. We've got a scripture song to learn. We're going to see some special guests telling us about some things coming up for kids in the next couple weeks. We've got a lesson from God's Word and some time answering questions that you all have asked in previous weeks. We hope that you'll continue to ask questions and to interact in the comments section. But let's worship the Lord together now. Hey church, here's a real good old Easter hymn called At Calvary. there faith bible church you're probably wondering yourself what i'm doing here dressed like this and uh i'm here to tell you two very important things the first thing is you're probably wondering uh i'm not going out for groceries i'm dressed like this because next week on the family hour is science night that's right we had science night scheduled for discovery but it got canceled but no longer we're bringing science night to you next week on the family hour we're going to have cool science experiments we're going to teach you how to do a science experiment that you guys can do at home and we want you to dress up in your best science costumes and post the pictures in the comments gonna be so cool so cool the other thing i want to talk to you about is that this week is holy week right it's easter's coming up and so next week we want to do a special holy week feature we want you to build part of the Easter story. Build your own creation, a part of the Easter story. Build something cool, send it in. You can use paper, you can use bricks, you can use clay, you can use Legos. Here, I got an example for you. One of my kids made this. There, look at that. You got a cross and even a tomb. Guess what? I can't, these, nope. It's empty, you can open it if you don't have big goofy gloves on. But that's beside the point. So build something cool take a picture of it send it to john gardner at jgardner at fbchurch.org and we'll see it in uh, in the video next week and don't forget dress up for science night
What's up, everyone? Welcome to Family Hour. Say hi. hi. Say hi. All right, so tonight we're gonna do a little review. We're gonna practice a song that we've done way at the beginning, not of this year, but of last year. Matthew 7, 24 through 25. Now, some of you may know this as the wise man on a rock song. So this was, like remember, this was the very first song we ever practiced. Right, buddy? Yeah. 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 So we're gonna explain the motions just in case you forgot. I personally haven't. This was my, one of my favorite songs to do. So we're gonna do that right now. My little assistant here is gonna help me. So what we're gonna do is the first motion. Remember, your parents might need a little encouragement, so don't be afraid to show them how to do it. What's well, the first motion is gonna be, therefore everyone who hears these words, make a book, of mine, these words, of mine and puts them into practice. Okay, let's try that one more time. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man. We'll do that a couple of times. Like he says, like a wise man. is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And then we'll do a little dance party. Huh? Yeah. We'll do a little dance party and then we'll do that again. But then there's a second part. And it goes, the rains came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet, it did not fall. Yet, it did not fall. Yet, it did not fall all. Then it goes again, one more time. The rains came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet, it did not fall. Yet, it did not fall. Yet, it did not fall all because he built his foundation on the rock. All right, I think you guys got it. I'm sure you remember it by now. Let's go ahead and do this. Let's go. These words of mine, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. Yeah. 
Good job. I knew you could remember it. Thanks for having fun with me. We'll see you later, okay? Hey church, I hope you've been following along with the Holy Week Timeline series this week. If not, you can find all the previous entries on our website, and I encourage you to check those out. But for now, let me catch you up on where we are as we walk through the week leading up to Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. On Sunday night, Dan Dean shared with us about the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday as the crowds welcomed Jesus to Jerusalem. But he showed us that though they worshipped him that day, they didn't really understand who he was. And he challenged us to think about this question, who is Jesus to you? On Monday, Jared Milligan spoke of Jesus' anger that the temple, which was supposed to be a place of worship, had become a house of corruption, where greedy merchants took advantage of the poor and the pious. In his righteous anger, Jesus drove out of the temple all those who had turned a house of prayer into a den of thieves. Surrounding the biblical account of the cleansing of the temple is the story of a barren fig tree which Jesus cursed, as Jared taught us last night. This fig tree was symbolic of the Jewish people, and especially of their leaders, whose holiness had withered away to nothing. They had the scriptures, but they didn't understand or obey them, and they bore no fruit. So Jesus spent much of Tuesday in a confrontation with the religious leaders, calling them hypocrites who were completely rotten. Jared left us last night with the question, where are the genuine worshipers? Jesus had been to the temple in the holy city. He'd been to the spiritual leaders of God's people. He'd even been cheered by massive crowds of people coming to celebrate Passover. Yet in none of these places had he found genuine worshipers. Which brings us to Wednesday. It's interesting that with three such eventful days in a row, Scripture tells us almost nothing about how Jesus spent this day, the day before the Passover. As Dan and Jared have both mentioned, Jesus knew he was going to die. He knew that this day would be his last full day of freedom, the last restful night that he would spend before his arrest, trial, and execution. If you knew you had one day left to live, how would you spend it? Some of us might spend it worrying about what was coming. Would it hurt to die? And will there really be life after death? Some might spend it partying trying to squeeze the maximum enjoyment out of life, which is how the Bible describes the outlook of those who believe this life is all there is. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Some might spend their time frantically putting their affairs in order, making sure they'd done everything they could do to leave a legacy for themselves. But Jesus didn't do any of these things. As best we can tell from Scripture, Jesus spent the Wednesday of Holy Week resting with his friends. On the one hand, that's not surprising. After all, he must surely have been exhausted following the triumphal entry, the cleansing of the temple, and a day filled with confrontation and teaching large crowds. And being fully man, he knew that he would need every ounce of strength he could get to face what was coming in the next 48 hours. But on the other hand, in a week filled with doing really hard things, let's not overlook the fact that resting, truly resting, can be really, really hard. I think that's something most of us can relate to right now, isn't it? I mean, if someone had asked me a couple months ago what I'd do if I was looking at the prospect of spending all day, every day at home with my family for two months and possibly more, I'd have felt like this was surely a time I would get some rest, right? But in all the conversations I've had with folks these last few weeks, nobody is sounding particularly well rested. Between worries about the pandemic, worries about the economy, worries about loved ones, worries about employment, worries about schooling, not to mention the challenges of being cooped up with the same people all day, every day, plus trying to figure out how to just navigate life in our new abnormal. Rest can be pretty hard to come by these days. But it's not as if we're about to die. Of course, it's possible that any one of us could die tomorrow, but as far as I know, none of us are going to bed tonight with the prospect of certain imminent death. And with certainty, none of us is facing betrayal, arrest, torture, torture, and brutal execution before the weekend. That's what Jesus was facing, and yet he rested. How did he do it? Jesus certainly wasn't anxious in his final moments. 
He had plenty to say about anxiety, though. In Matthew 6, during the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In Philippians 4, 6, and 7, Paul writes, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus was able to rest because he had a peace beyond all understanding, a peace that came from total reliance upon and trust in the Father. And it's a peace he freely offers to us if we will only do as Peter writes, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Jesus also didn't have any need to spend his final full day of freedom out pursuing worldly pleasures. He knew the eternal pleasures that awaited him in heaven. So often we allow our desires for pleasure or amusement to rob us of rest rather than holding out for the good stuff that's coming. And there was no need for Jesus to spend this time busying himself with work. He had no final preparations to make because his entire life had been one of devotion to the work the Father had given him. He didn't leave any unfinished business, which is why on the cross he was able to cry out, It is finished. It may seem at times like our work is never finished. But even when we have a load which seems unbearable, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I hope we can all learn from Jesus to rest. We can cast our anxieties on him. We can place our hope and our trust in him. We can bring our heavy burdens to him and we can find our rest in him. I pray that whatever you may be facing this week, you will turn to Christ and seek the rest and the peace that he offers. To help you with that, I also want to encourage you to sing this week's Family Worship Hymn of the Week. It's one we sang together for the first time this past Sunday called Christ is Mine Forevermore. This hymn speaks to a lot of these issues we've just been looking at, from the opening line which reminds us that our days are numbered, to our temptation to pursue worldly pleasure. But there's also great hope in these lyrics as we're reminded that our God supplies our every need. He will strengthen us and sustain us through every battle and will deliver us safely home where we will walk side by side with the King of Kings, who is our greatest treasure. But it's the second verse that Laurie and I keep coming back to during this particularly trying season. Hear these lyrics before we sing them. Mine are tears in times of sorrow, darkness not yet understood. Through the valley I must travel, though I see no earthly good. But mine is peace that flows from heaven and the strength in times of need. I know my pain will not be wasted. Christ completes his work in me. Amen. Let's sing this together. Mine are days that God has numbered. I was made to walk with Him, yet I look for worldly treasure and forsake the King of Kings. But mine is hope in my Redeemer, though I fall, His love is sure, for Christ has paid for every failing, I am His forevermore. Our tears in times of sorrow, darkness not yet understood. 
Through the valley I must travel Where I see no earthly good But mine is peace that flows from heaven And the strength in times of need I know my pain will not be wasted Christ completes His work in me Mine are days here as a stranger Pilgrim on a narrow way One with Christ I will Mine is armor for this battle, strong enough to last the war. And he has said he will deliver safely to the golden shore. And mine are keys to Zion City, where beside the king I walk, for there my Christ is mine forevermore. Come rejoice now, O my soul, for His love. Bible Church, uh, we are doing our question and answer time for the family hour a little differently uh, now that we're recording it before. So I've got here with me uh, three guests, uh, Jeremy Kuhn, one of our elders, and John Gardner, and uh, Paul Funchess as well. And so we're going to tackle some of the questions that you sent in uh, last week on the, the live stream for the family hour. And if you have more questions you want us to tackle another week or try to answer, you can uh, put those in the comments right now. You can also email those to info at fbchurch.org, so our church's uh, general email. And you can also text to the number that you're going to see on the screen. So we'd love to get more questions from you that you'd like us to talk about. We're going to be having different people come in and be our guests for this question and answer time. So um, thank you for uh, edifying us with those good questions. So we'll start out with a question from Matt Parker. Um, he had a, a question, do you have a recommendation for a truthful and accurate news source for updates on the epidemic? And I'm going to ask you, John, you're, uh, you're very – versed in news and uh, different sources of media. So tell us your thoughts on that. Good thing. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a big struggle sometimes, especially when we're just completely inundated with news sources. You know, everywhere you look, um, everybody has an opinion. Everybody has an expert that they want to um, post. And, and so a couple things as, as I'm trying to uh, – stay on top of the news and stay current, but also to, to practice wisdom. Um, I think a couple of things that come to mind is, is first of all, just to recognize that there's no such thing as completely unbiased source of information. You know, even, even the most objective people have um, a, a filter that they're, they're putting things through. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have an agenda, 
Um, but uh, news is is very rarely just information. Um, so I think as as believers, one of the things that's most important for us to uh, keep in mind is the concept of worldview. You know, there, there's a certain way that we um, view the world and interpret data as as we hear it. And we want to make sure that uh, we recognize that most news sources that we have are, are putting things through a different filter than, than scripture. Where, um, yeah, so no matter which news source you're, you're listening to or no matter whose press conference you're watching, um, mo- most people are not giving us um, a great biblical understanding of, of what's going on. So I think that it's important for us to uh, seek out primary sources. I know for me personally, I've been every day watching um, the local, uh, there's been daily press conferences with the Spokane Regional Health District and the Spokane County Sheriff. Uh, every every day they're putting out information and that's been really good. Governor Inslee's doing um, uh, press conferences almost every day. The president's doing press conferences. You know, as far as being aware of, of what is what is going on and what's being put out there, I think those primary sources are are good. Um, I I don't, to be honest, I don't watch a lot of network news or read a lot of those news sources. Um, I do think it is good to hear from others who are trusted. Uh, so for me, there are um, there's a number of daily podcasts that I think do a really good job of of summarizing the news from a Christian worldview. Al Mohler has a daily podcast. that's very good. Um, World Magazine has a daily podcast that, uh, you know, there, there are many others. Um, and, and it's, uh, it's very important just to avoid kind of the echo chamber. It's really easy to just find people who, um, who are saying the things you hope are true. And I'm not accusing you, Matt Parker of this. I'm accusing you, John Gardner of this, uh, and um, uh, but that that's something we all just need to be aware of, and and I think hearing from a lot of different sources, but also knowing when to just turn off the stream of information and just read the Bible, uh, and, and realize that that the end of this is known to God and and not to us or to any other man, and uh, that ultimately that's where that's where our trust is. That's great. Thanks, John. Thanks for that those tips and. I know people can reach out to you anytime if they want to get more specifics on some of those. So um, the next question is from a yeah, place definitely. to be, from a place to be a uh, kid. Uh, Rachel Jarm shared with us one of their questions. And I'm going to ask you, Jeremy, to, to try to answer this one. Um, the question is, how can I be compassionate towards or show the love of Christ to my mom and dad during this quarantine time? Jeremy, what are your thoughts on that? Go ahead and uh, unmute your, your uh, microphone there. Yeah, good advice, Nathan, not muting my mic. So that's a really good question. <coughs> uh, one thing to keep in mind is that whatever situation we're facing in this world shouldn't change the way that we're interacting with other people. Um, in fact, when things are harder, we want to do a, a better job of being mindful about how people uh, can be loved. So from a, from a kid who's wondering how to show compassion and love to his parents, um, you know, the first thing you want to think about is how, how can you submit to their leadership and authority in your home? And you want to show the, your love for them by obeying what they say for you to do. That's what Jesus told us about what it looks like to love God is to obey him. Uh, so that's the first thing you can do. I think another thing right now with the situation that we're in is that there are, are changes that we've had to face as far as how we're getting together with friends. Um, so, it can be hard if you're asking to do things that you've been told we can't really do this that way anymore. Um, Cause it's just something that, that us as parents are still having to wrestle with of how we can get together with friends if that's possible. Um, and what that, what that looks like. So be patient with your parents um, as even they are still trying to figure out how to handle some things. Um, and then uh, another thing is, you know, we're probably facing things that we used to like to do that we can't do anymore. And that's causing us uh, grief in our own hearts, exposing some sin about um, just an idolatrous hold on to, to what we'd like to do. And 
So I think one way to really show some compassion to your parents is to not um, have a bad attitude about not being able to do the things that you used to be able to do. Um, Cause your parents just like you are, are facing those same hardships in different ways. And so we want to be sensitive to how other people are hurting, um, how other people are trying to deal with the chaos that's going on with so many changes. And uh, thankfully things have kind of stabled out a little bit. We're not facing as many changes as we were a couple of weeks ago, uh, but we still are facing a, a time that's very different. So just being understanding with perhaps some inconsistency because we're still trying to figure some things out. So I think that's, that's about great. It. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, kids, we want to encourage you to keep praying for your kids if you're trusting and praying for your parents so that we have compassion on them. And I'm sure we could say a lot more about that, but um, you might even ask your parents how you can have compassion on them. Uh, let's, let's go to a question from Logan Long. I'm going to ask you, Paul, to tackle this one first, and then Jeremy or John, you may want to weigh in too. The question has to do with the end times. Uh, what is all this stuff that's been happening with COVID-19, this pandemic, you know, the big earthquake in Idaho, all this other stuff? What does it have to do with Jesus coming back? How should we interpret this? What, is it, what does it have to do with the possibility of Christ returning soon? Um, how should we think about that? Yeah, um, I, I understand that question. I think I remember the day when we had that earthquake and we had like the hail-like snow things coming down and we had uh, the coronavirus. Tornado in Richland, same yeah, day. We, <laughs> we had weird stuff going on. Um, I, I understand where the question comes from. It's a great question, Logan. Uh, all I would say is, you know, we have been waiting on Jesus to return ever since he left. And uh, we've been told to be busy about what our mission is and expect him to come. And w what's going on in the world is not anything different than what has been going on in the world. The, the, the creation groans and longs uh, for the restoration that God will bring and uh, in Christ's coming. And so uh, I, I think what we our, our mind needs to be on the imminent return of Jesus. And he's coming back. That's, that's true. That's real. Uh, you, you, you need to, to embrace that. And if anything, I think it teaches us that uh, it kind of, kind of prompts us to an urgency, maybe that we didn't have before. Because if we look around at the world right now, I mean, it is a crazy situation happening, and it ought to create an urgency in us. We have a mission, and we have, we have uh, good news to share with a world that is lost and dying. And uh, Jesus, Jesus has always been potentially coming back at any moment. Okay, So uh, that, Jesus is returning. He's the king. And when he comes back, you need to be ready, ready to meet him as king. And that's not changed uh, and, and still is the same. And if anything, it just is a, a reminder for us that, uh, that that coming can happen at any time. Mm, that's great. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, it really is like those birth pains like Jesus talked about in Matthew 24. Yeah. And you never know when the last birth pain is going to happen. You know, it's, they're all pointing to the reality that it's coming back. So, Jeremy or John, did you want to add anything to that? Jesus is coming back. Be ready. There's a song about that. We could sing that song. There's yeah, a lot of great songs about that. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, the biggest thing is that, um, you know, one, one day this is, uh, there's not going to be uh, epidemics. There's not going to be, um, you know, the, the earth is going to stop groaning. <laughs> the, the, the curse will be broken. There's no more sickness, no more death. That's, you know, that's where I, uh, hang my hat at the end of the day is, is this is, this is what we have to look forward to. And, you know, even, even when we have days that are really, really great and there's not an epidemic going on and there's not uh, weather things, there's, you know, a good economy. The best day on earth is nothing compared to, to what's coming. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And I would just echo what's already been said. These are the beginning of the birth pains that's been happening since uh, Jesus went up to heaven and we are waiting for his return. Um, we know that all these things are going to be taking place. The, the world and the church has faced plagues and natural disasters uh, since it began. And there's nothing new about that. So, but the, the good thing is, is that these things should make us look forward to his return uh, because we see that this world is broken. And we know that he's going to come and restore all things. Amen. That'll be a good day. 
Uh, then this next book has to do with uh, what has been one of the most foundational books that you've read that have impacted your walk with God? Jessica Horning is asking, and I'm sure many of the people listening are, are reading more books these days, perhaps. So, John, why don't you start us off? You're quite the avid reader. Tell us uh, an impactful book or even maybe a, a way we can find a list of other books we could read. Yeah, goodness. Um, asking me for book recommendations is a little dangerous. Um, but uh, if I, you know, the, the question was what's been a foundational book. There, there was a, a man when I was in college who discipled me. And the first book that he put in my hands um, was called Don't Waste Your Life by John Piper. And so f- for me personally, that was, that was definitely foundational in, in the sense of um, that's the first book that I read that was substantial from a, a just not just a doctrinal standpoint, but just a, you know, what are you doing with your life? It wasn't a question that I'd really considered. Um, so that whetted my appetite to want to read more. Um, a couple other books that have been really impactful for me, um, you know, Mere Christianity by, by C.S. Lewis, um, uh, The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer, The Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges, um, uh, a book called Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. It's, it is really small, but man, that, that helped me understand a, a lot about um, just what does it mean to say God is sovereign. And, and especially in a time like this, that would be a really good, good book for a lot of people to go check out. That's by a man named J.I. Packer. Um, as far as other book recommendations, I, I keep track. I've been doing a really bad job of this the last few weeks. I've still been reading books. I've not kept up with writing book reviews. Um, there's actually a, a, a resource on our church website of just books that I'm reading and reviewing this year. And so uh, not everything on there is something I would recommend, but um, just there's also been some really good ones. So uh, anybody, anytime can ask me for a book recommendation and uh, hope if you've got some time to talk. There you go. You know, a resource that we can lean on. Jeremy or Paul, do you want to mention a, a most foundational book for you? Uh, so one that was really foundational for me when I was a new believer was Knowing God by J.F. Packer. Um, just getting to know who God is, um, along with, uh, John mentioned, uh, the knowledge of the holy, I think. Um, A.W. Tozer. Was that the one you mentioned? It's not, but that was really good too. Yeah, so anyways, those are helpful as far as knowing who our God is. Um, and then one as far as shaping your life, um, I really enjoyed Holiness by J.C. Ryle. Uh, it's an older book. It was written, I think, at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, um, or maybe the 19th to 20th. I think it was about 100 years ago that he wrote. So the language is a little archaic, but it's still really readable. Um, super rich, really, really practical in terms of how we consider our life. Um, I would say that that's a hundred year old version of don't waste your life um, in, in, in its own way. That's one of the but, next books. The same guy recommended that. I- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So those are my top three. Um, I haven't really read a book that deals a whole lot with what we're facing right now, but the mystery of Providence is a Puritan classic. Um, and it's been a while since I've read that one, but it really gives you a good idea um, about how people think about how God is working in the world um, that we've kind of lost touch with in our day and age where we have a lot of naturalism going on and just, see that, you know, natural disasters is natural and nothing, nothing behind, uh, nothing behind the scenes as far as God is concerned. So that was a, that's probably a good one to look at too. I think Great. John, I can't remember the author. It's a Puritan paperback, The Mystery of Providence. Yeah. It's, it's either a John or a Richard. Yeah. That takes care of most of them. Yeah. We are almost, almost out of time. I should also point out. Go ahead, John. Sorry. Um, I realized I mostly just said theology books. I actually read a lot more literature than theology. And as far as shaping worldview, um, I think we're people who are shaped by stories. So uh, theology is good. Stories are also good. Mm. Amen. Most of the Bible is stories, so it's uh, something that God's used. <laughs> yeah. He didn't use. Let's let's wrap it up with with uh, one last question. Um, I'm going to ask you to answer this one, Paul. This is from Jay Wiley. Uh, why did Jesus pray for people's forgiveness? 
when he already knew who would be forgiven. So thinking about Jesus on the cross, this is uh, Holy Week, and we're thinking about that a lot. Um, so how would you answer that question, Paul? Um, yeah, so in the, the narrative there, uh, when Jesus asked the Father to forgive them, for they know not what they do, I think the point of that is to demonstrate um, the willingness and the desire to forgive sinners, even those sinners that would crucify Christ. All, all of us, all of us uh, participate in the crucifixion of Jesus. We all were the ones. Our sins are what put Jesus there. And, and it just shows Jesus' willingness to forgive sinners, those who oppose him. Um, so when, when you ask the question, how does he pray for forgiveness even though he knows, or why does he pray for forgiveness even though he knows who he's going to forgive? Again, the narrative is demonstrating Christ's willingness to forgive, his desire to forgive. Uh, we know God is sovereign. We know God knows all those that are his. Christ knows all those that are his, those that are his people. But the sovereignty of God does not cancel out the need to pray and God's ordination of that means uh, to accomplish his will and purpose. So uh, and th this is a big question because God is sovereign, so why pray? God is sovereign, so why evangelize? He knows who's going to be saved, so why pray? Why evangelize? Well, because God has ordained those as means to carry out his will. And so uh, we, we see a good demonstration of that where Jesus, he, he asks the Father, he prays to the Father, Father, forgive them. And even though Jesus knows who's going to be forgiven and who's, who's not ultimately going to be forgiven, uh, we see our need to pray even for what is the Lord's will, because that's, that, that's the means that he has ordained. And so we participate with God in what God is doing when we pray, when we evangelize, and we should take all of our prayers to him and obey him in that and also evangelize even though he knows who's going to be saved he has chosen the means uh, to, to accomplish his will by us telling and sharing that good news so uh, sovereignty is a wonderful foundation to prayer and a wonderful foundation to evangelism um, i really i don't really don't know how you pray or how you evangelize if you don't have a, a, a firm uh, belief in the sovereignty of god I don't know if I answered your question there, but I think I did somewhere. <laughs> well, you can talk to Jay Wiley. If you, get, if you haven't answered it, he, he'll, uh, he'll ask you again. But uh, I'm going to just take that as a segue to encourage all of us to be praying. Uh, we're in a, a period of 28 days where, as a church, we really want to commit to prayer and fasting. Um, so every day we want to be praying for the growth of our other fellow believers, the salvation of lost people, and God's mercy on our whole world in this, in this pandemic. So I encourage you to be praying for that and uh, take time to really seek the Lord uh, and, and pray. It's, it's such a privilege we have to be before our Father and talk to Him. So thank you for your questions you sent in. I hope you send in more questions. We'll have another Q&A next week. Um, we care about you and want to know how we can be praying for you and, and shepherding you. So please let us know. Um, thank you, Faith Bible Church. Thanks. Is somebody Thanks. want to pray? Oh, yeah. Yeah, before we uh, close up here, we're going to pray. Paul, you want to pray? Sure. Let's pray. All right. Lord, we are thankful for who you are. You are sovereign. Every square inch of the universe, you are over and you control. Uh, nothing that is happening uh, has caught you by surprise. And we can be confident in you. We can be comforted in you. And uh, we believe that uh, you are orchestrating all things for your glory. I pray for every family uh, this week. I pray that they would have a strong hold on your care for them, that as we've heard recently, they would cast all of their cares upon you uh, because you do care for them and uh, that they would humble themselves under your mighty hand. And so we, we ask, uh, Lord, for your direction, help us to be compassionate, show us opportunities to be compassionate on those who need and uh, give us opportunity, uh, even in our families, to speak the gospel and I pray that you would uh, produce in us fruit of righteousness this week. And we thank you. Thank you for letting us be your people. And we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, Jeremy Kuhn and John Gardner and Paul Funches. Yeah, yeah thank you. Good morning, guys. See you. Bye. Bye. Good night.